All right, so in this round, I'm paired against Grandmaster Christopher Repka, and uh, he was also having, I think, a pretty decent tournament. Um, and I wasn't sure what to expect for this game because he's mainly um, a D4 player and against the Kings Indian. Um, I, I think he's played a couple different things. I think he's played like the H3 system quite a bit um, with Knight F3 and maybe Bishop E3. Um, Fianchetto, I think, is also part of his repertoire, maybe even the classical uh, system as well. Here he um, surprises me definitely with this move, Bishop E2, uh, which generally leads to either Bishop E3 or Bishop G5, the uh, Averbach. Uh, I castled here. Now he goes H4. So this was definitely a, kind of a surprise. And I looked at this line somewhat recently, but <laughs> not not before the game, right? So unfortunately, I just kind of forgot to um, review this one. And uh, yeah, kind of a, a kind of a miss on my end because this line is is very trendy um, and very popular these days. So I really should have been kind of more up to date on it. Um, the idea, okay, is just to push h5 and in many cases advance h6, and just take some space. In some cases, take on g6 and open the h file and, and play for mate. But I think this is generally actually more of like a strategic kind of push. Um, there's different lines here that, that black can play, but I went with the one that I had you know, been kind of familiar with, which is to go c5, d5, and uh, I played b5 here. So I think this line is generally considered pretty okay for black. Um, we're now playing a Banco Gambit where uh, white is committed to h4, which is kind of a weakening move. In many cases, white would rather actually play h3 and, and cover the g4 square. Um, so it's kind of an improved version of the Benko. Yeah, I should note, I, if I have this position again, I think h5 actually very reasonable move. And this would probably be my recommendation for, for other Kings Indian players. It's just play h5, stop white from playing there. You know, they'll put the bishop on g5 um, or something, but... Um, I think black can get decent play here, like knight c6, bishop g4, e5, and I think this is the way to go. Um, I mean, things are not like 100% simple here, but I think that's kind of the easier approach. That said, I think that Benko is also very, very playable, especially if you know you kind of like sharp and, and, and unbalanced positions. This one definitely leads to uh, kind of more um, double-edged play. So it takes a6, he goes a4. Uh, a takes b5, bishop takes b5, bishop a6. These moves are all uh, pretty normal. And I was mainly aware of one high level game here, which was, uh, I think it was MVL as white against Svidler as black. In that game, I remember that Svidler had basically equalized the position, then somewhere like he blundered and ended up losing, but I was pretty much just kind of following his setup because from, from what I recalled, like he was basically fine. Uh, so bishop d2. Um, I guess white has other options as well, but I think the play is pretty logical here from both sides. Uh, white defends the rook, and on bishop takes b5, takes with the pawn. Rook takes a1, queen a1, queen b6. And here, yeah, I'm just kind of following this plan that I saw in that in that game. And the idea is to go knight d7, uh, bring the rook to b8, and then bring this knight to c7, and to one day pick up the pawn on b5. And if black can win back the b5 pawn, then... Okay, black solves, you know, all their issues. So it's kind of a, um, yeah, yeah, very, very kind of sharp position for both sides. So knight of three, knight d7, castles. And I should note that my opponent was playing like extremely quickly, like just making his moves instantly. So like it, it was clear he, he had prepped this quite deeply. Whereas I was like already starting to like spend some time because, you know, I kind of knew the setup, but like I wasn't, you know, 100% sure, and I didn't want to just kind of like walk into something that's uh, that's just bad. Um, but I did, I did kind of walk into something. So rook b8, he goes queen a6 uh, again immediately. Now I spent some time here, and I went uh, knight e8. And um, okay, just playing for knight c7 here. Um, and now white goes rook a1. And yeah, at this point, things really start to get difficult because like, I'm honestly not sure what to do. 
Um, he's still playing like instantly, so he's, it's clear that he's in his computer prep. And if I go knight c7 here, he didn't like the looks of um, takes on b6, and then either knight takes or rook takes, he's gonna go rook a7. So like knight takes b6 here, rook a7, and then this knight is hit and the e7 pawn is also um, under attack. So I didn't like knight c7, I ended up going king f8. And um, I was hoping with this move that I maybe I get him out of book, like because at this point I have no idea how DP's prepared. And um, to me, this looked like okay, kind of like a useful move. Maybe he didn't check this one. Maybe he mainly looked at like knight c7. I don't know. But okay, king f8 looks thematic. I defend the e7 pawn. It's kind of like a typical Benko move. And maybe I'm preparing knight c7 here next. Um, and then he goes rook a5 like really fast. <laughs> so I'm like no. I'm like, dang, he's still he's still in his book. And like this move rook a5 was very intimidating because he wants knight a4. And it feels like if white is just able to break the blockade here, you know, I might just lose to this uh, to this b pawn. So very, very scary. Um, you know, after the game, you know, I looked up the line and, and actually this is still the, the MVL Swither game. In that game, MVL played h5 and then black played knight c7 here. Uh, queen a4, he went rook a8, and again, he was equal and ended up uh, kind of blundering somewhere. Um, but basically, that was that was fine for black. So rook a5 actually is a very, um, I think, interesting improvement on, on that game. And uh, yeah, at this point, you know, I was mainly considering knight c7, but I actually rejected it let's say for the for the wrong reason, because I'm still kind of concerned about takes takes rook a7. But somehow I'd forgot actually in this position I can take on c3 and then take on b5. So actually black is getting the pawn back and is absolutely just totally, totally fine. Um, and the other line that e7 would be hanging so it wasn't as easy, but here e7 is defended. So yeah, black just takes on c3 and, and everything is okay. Um, after the game I found out that uh, Y was actually gonna play knight a4 in this position which I don't think was a move I even like looked at during the game. So if I played knight c7, I would have seen knight a4 immediately. Um, which, yeah, it's like a very kind of, would be a very intimidating move um, to see. Because if black takes the queen on a6, white takes on b6 here, um, and then it seems like white is ready to take with the pawn on, uh, on a6, and that a pawn is going to be very very scary. Uh, of course this is still uh, an extra pawn. So yeah afterwards we were discussing a little bit and um, I guess the main move here is queen takes b5 which yeah I can't say if I would have found this during the game. I definitely could have considered playing knight c7 you know ha missing knight a4 but but playing it let's say because I'm expecting the queen trade and then after knight a4, if we had this position, I don't think, I don't know, this queen takes b5 is such a strange move to me. I mean, after the game we were discussing, he was saying like, this is this is kind of like the, the computer line um, where, well, the idea is to trade queens, but kind of on better terms. It's just like a very funny desperado. If rook takes, then knight takes on a6, and the rook is, um, of course, defended, and... Uh, yeah, if queen takes, then we're just just taking on b5, and, and black is uh, black is all right. So the main move for white is queen c6, which again would have been extremely uh, intimidating to see. <laughs> Such a crazy move. I mean, it's so like it's so wild. Like the rook is defended, knight is defended. Um, then apparently, like takes takes knight b6. Um, but, you know, the prep continues, actually, I was looking at this a little bit with the engine, it's like, it's, it's a very forcing line, like, um, both sides have to find uh, a lot of only moves. So even if I had found some of these moves, I actually think it would have been, it still just feels like an incredibly dangerous situation, and definitely feels like one mistake away from, from losing. Um, so yeah, for me, this is an opening that I, I, I really have to revisit, because in general, I don't like lines where I have to find like only moves to to survive. I don't I don't think most players do. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna look for for some improvements um, 
along the way. And there's also different setups that, that Black can, can play as well. Um, but yeah, this game I really feel like was a big, uh, big opening problem. So I ended up going Queen B7. I mean, to me, this, this just felt like a more natural move with the idea that if white trades, then I recapture with the rook on b7, I'm defending the seventh rank, I can play knight c7 and um, kind of keep the blockade. Um, but he goes queen c6, and at this point he, he started spending a little bit of time, so I knew I had kind of like messed up, <laughs> not found the computer move. Um, so queen c6, and uh, okay, very annoying move. Now I can never really trade queens here because white's pawns would be too strong. Um, but I go knight b6, and uh, Playing for knight c4, he, he went uh, b3 here pretty quickly, and uh, and then I went knight c7. Um, actually, at this point, the engine shows bishop takes c3, um, followed by f5, and says that black is equalized here, um, which, yeah, like I can I can tell you neither of us consider this during the game. Um, so I don't know. I'm gonna have to look at this one a little bit deeper because. To me, this is just not something, <laughs> like, yeah, I can tell it's not something I considered uh, at all. Um, but I wanted to mention it, because the engine's very excited about it. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, it just takes, takes F5. Yeah, it's so obvious. <laughs> like, there's, like, knight G5. I mean, it looks insane. So my instinct here is that this is just uh, some engine insanity. Um, but I might take a... a a deeper look because obviously the engine has some some concrete stuff in mind like if e takes f5 there's knight takes d5 and who knows maybe there's there's an instructive idea um lurking here uh but yeah my first instinct is that uh, the black's position is just very very difficult and yeah this bishop c3 is just uh just crazy um so anyway knight c7 he goes knight a4 and now of course if i take on e4 then white gets to undouble his pawns and that's that's a big problem um, so I go back, knight c8, queen d7, uh, very scary move, threatening queen d8, maiden 1. Uh, I played back, knight to b6, and uh, now if white, okay, if queen c6, we, we're repeating, right? So that's totally fine for black. If white trades on b6, I go queen takes b6, and then the b5 pawn actually could could end up falling here, because knight takes b5 feels like uh, an actual threat. So the position did feel like, to me, like, you know, white has to be super precise here to kind of uh, hold on to his advantage. Um, but yeah, it ended up being very difficult for me to play. So queen g4. I think this was... Uh, I think this was probably the right move. And um, yeah, now white starts playing on the king side. So he's going for h5, queen f4 ideas, knight g5. It's kind of annoying. And... Uh, this is, okay, one of the main reasons, you know, they usually say that white should keep the queens on in the banco is because usually in the banco, black is focused on the queen side and, and white should be trying to get some some chances on uh, the king side. Uh, so I go queen c8. I'm definitely, yeah, hoping to get the queens off the board because if takes, knight takes, and the b-pawn will, be, uh, will be pretty weak here. Uh, he goes queen f4. And now I played h6. So of course I'm trying to cover knight g5, but I think this was this was probably wrong. You know I think during the game the the second thing I was considering was h5, um, which I think would be uh, would be better here, um, because in the game White ends up playing h5 himself, and I'm actually not able to hold the king side. And I just wasn't able to really anticipate that in time. So h5 is also not ideal because we're giving up uh, the g5 square. But black goes bishop f6 here, or king g8, let's say knight g5, bishop f6. Yeah, maybe it's not so bad still. Like white still has, I mean, definitely looks nice for white, like they can go g4, for example. But um, black at least has some time to bring pieces back, like knight d7, knight e5, or take on b5, and... Well, compared to the game, this, of course, is, is, is much, much better. So this was maybe my main, you know, outside of the opening, this was probably my main, like, middle game mistake was allowing white to play h5 and not playing it myself here. Because you never know, like, okay, in many cases you don't want to give up the g5 square, but here I think it was uh, it, it was more solid to, to play this way. Because queen c8, queen f4, h6, uh, 
White goes bishop c3. In fact, uh, according to the engine, already could have played h5 here and, uh, and sacked. And, and this would be actually a very, very, very dangerous attack and, and just a winning position for white with this h-pawn being um, strong. There was quite a few of these ideas that were considered during the game. At this point, I don't think either of us really felt like white had to do this. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sure he, he at least considered it. Um, but he starts with bishop c3, which I think is a little bit more logical, just trading off the dark square bishop. I play knight d7 because I'm trying to get more pieces over to the king side. And now h5. And yeah, at this point, things start to look very, very scary. Because if g5, I felt like, you know, the sack is going to happen. Let's say bishop g7 first, king takes, knight takes g5. And uh, if black goes king f8 here, h6 just looked like I'm losing you know, queen g7 coming, h7, and my pieces are completely stuck. So, yeah, just looked like a lost position. Also consider, like, maybe playing, like, king h7 here, um, but I didn't didn't like the looks of, of this either. Minimum, I thought white could take on e7 and get, I think, now four pawns <laughs> for the piece, and now all these other pawns are hanging as well. It's like rook a7 coming and b6 ideas. So, yeah, this just looked losing uh, directly. Um, so h5, I go king g8 here. And uh, I think I'm also not in time. I should n mention, um, like, knight takes b5, because uh, white can take on g6 and, and threaten and mate. And yeah, again, black's king side is just getting completely opened up. Uh, so king g8 uh, was played. White took on g6. Now he goes queen g4. Uh, just targeting the weakness, I traded on c3, knight takes c3, king g7, knight h4, and yeah, basically black is just uh, just having too many weaknesses here. b5 pawn is surviving, now knight h4 is hitting g6 and f5. Um, I do have knight e5 to go into the end game, but the end game is just, just lost for black. White trades and goes b6. And now the b pawn is simply too strong. Um, the seventh rank is also a big target for white, and yeah, black would need multiple moves here to um, to, to somehow stabilize. But yeah, so 98, rook a7 was played, um, king f7, f4. I, I think my opponent's technique was just essentially perfect. Um, now hitting the knight off of e5, I went knight d3, f5. And we can see white's idea here, he's just immediately getting his knight into f5, and then the e7 pawn. Um, is hanging as well, and basically all of all of black spawns are are dropping. Uh, so ninety five, you know, I tried to resist however I could, but yeah, ultimately there wasn't a whole lot I could do here. Um, so I end up giving a second pawn, um, but at least I get rook b eight, and I'm just kind of just trying to play for some kind of blockade or some stability. Um, and and yeah, okay, if I get a couple tempi, then. That's great, but of course white has time to uh, uh, to pick up more pawns. So rook h7. Um, now if king g6 here, then I think just rook d7, and uh, you know I'm not going anywhere. So knight g7. I, I tried to play for some more activity. Takes king e5. We're now down three pawns, um, but we're hoping to at least get this one back and you know try to have an active king, whatever. Um, but knight b5. I play king takes e4, knight takes d6. Actually, this was very nice how, how I converted um, king takes d5. Because at first glance, it looks kind of awkward for white, like maybe knight e6, you know, the knight is loose. If I win the b-pawn, then of course it's I'm only down one pawn. Um, but he found a very nice move here, rook h8 to finish. Which, uh, yeah, actually is quite pretty. Idea being rook takes h8, knight c8, and... Uh, that's it. The pawn, the pawn can't be stopped. Yeah. So rook h8 uh, prompted resignation because it's such a pretty move. I think this is this is usually the right moment to resign. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, that was it. So tough game. I mean, it was kind of hard to uh, really really assess this one. It felt very much like you know I got caught in the opening. Um, and, and received like a difficult position where my opponent was better and kind of knew the ideas um, more clearly. Uh, but I don't know, I mean, I definitely could have played the middle game better. 
uh, that's for sure. I think not playing h5 was just a very, very serious mistake. Um, but, but yeah, to me, it was definitely a big, um, a big opening uh, fiasco in, in this one. So that was round six. After this game, that would mean I'm on one and a half out of six, which is not, uh, not a great score, but, you know, three games to go. And uh, I try to, you know, I try to learn from every game. So it helps me deal with uh, difficult tournaments because, you know, I know it's not my last tournament. I know there's going to be more games and um, I can just, uh, well, hopefully play better. Stop.